the IGF. This year's theme is on technical internet governance and the importance of looking at new ways of understanding and working together to protect what we all know is an important resource in this digital age, the internet. This year's theme uh, is to identify a distinction between technical internet governance and internet governance. Internet governance has historically focused on questions of who has access to the internet and what they do with that access. Technical internet governance focuses on how the internet operates. Our speakers today, in order of appearance, are Martin Butterman, ICANN Chair of the Board, Joran Marby, ICANN President and CEO, Marika Keo, the Security and Stability Advisory Committee, liaison to the ICANN Board, and David Conrad, Senior Vice President and Chief Technology Officer at ICANN. During the session, we will explore with our speakers what is meant by technical internet governance, the distinction between technical internet governance and internet governance, and ICANN's position and role within technical internet governance. We will be taking your questions after the speakers are done. Please make sure when asking a question to use the Q&A pod or raise your hand to be recognized by the host and unmuted. With that, I would like to turn to our first speaker, Martin Butterman, Chair of the ICANN Board. Martin? Really want to talk about the future of the internet. Uh, before we commence, I would like to take a moment to share with you that an important contributor, not only to the IGF, but also to the ICANN's multi-stakeholder model has passed away yesterday. Ms. Marilyn Kate, and I want to convey our deepest respect and gratitude for her tireless contributions. May she rest in peace. So today's open forum comes at an opportune time in the evolution of the internet's governance. The internet is a pervasive, complex network of networks but I can, along with other technical organizations, play a fundamental role in maintaining its stability and security. ICANN's mission is to preserve and enhance the operational stability, reliability, security, and global interoperability of the domain name system, the DNS. ICANN coordinates parts of the DNS, which translates computer host names into IP addresses, the numbers as well as the internet protocol addressing system used to route internet traffic. Some of you know this, others may not. I can help assign the IP addresses to our partners, the RARs, the, who then distribute them to internet service providers. The ICANN community, made up of members of the technical, business, government, and civil society communities, helps support the domain name system by defining and helping publicize the rules. Without ICANN's management of this unifying system known as the domain name system or the DNS, we wouldn't have a global and accessible internet where it's possible to find each other anywhere in the world and without risk of confusion. For ICANN to be successful, it's necessary for us to understand and identify the major trends and forces that could have an impact on the probability of the DNS going forward. And in tackling this, we have captured our understanding in our strategic plan for 2020, 2025, both touching upon the challenges that arise from a security perspective, a DNS evolution perspective, as well as a global governance perspective. This document will provide important guidance to our work for the years to come. And you can find it on the ICANN website, ICANN.org. We very much recognize that all these areas will evolve over time and we, please, we keep close track of developments that may require adapting our strategic plan going forward as things that you don't expect will come up every time. And at least to reflect on it on an annual basis, community, organization and board alike. Internet governance refers to the shared principles, norms, rules, decision-making procedures policies and standards that govern and shape the internet on how it's used, 
For example, exchanges at forums, such as the one we're participating in now, the Internet Governance Forum, have traditionally aimed to identify current challenges across a variety of internet issues and exploring potential solutions. Taking broadly, internet governance can be viewed as explorations of the mechanisms that define how the internet is used. When we focus on internet governance, we see the following. The global and cross-border nature of the internet challenges, the concept of sovereignty and governance by governments or groups of governments. This is largely why internet governance has evolved organically through an international multi-stakeholder process. This process is a way to tackle the challenges inherent in a network of networks that is developed by people for people, cross borders around the world. And ICANN is very much based on and committed to this multi-stakeholder model. It got us where we are today. It's transparent. It's uh, the inclusion, the transparency, the inclusion, participation to it, as well as the expertise in it are critical for governing discussions related to a critical element of the internet. We very much recognize that no stakeholder can run the internet alone. And we reflect that recognition both within the ICANN ecosystem and with other stakeholders with stakes that go beyond ICANN's mission or besides ICANN's mission. As the internet continues to develop, the opportunities, challenges and risks will continue to grow. And we need to address those together. So with the exponential change in the internet's transformation over the past few years, introduction of legislation like the GDPR, the, the data protection regulation, and technical developments like the internet of things, artificial intelligence, we must work together to ensure that the internet continues to develop safely, securely, and in a stable manner, so that it continues to be an internet we trust enough to use it. When we look at the future of the internet, the choice for us is not between globally and the respect of rule of law or national system. It's both. They can coexist. To ensure they coexist, we have to work hard and through innovative processes and approaches in order to reinterpret, adapt our fundamental values and norms for the reality of a transnational and connected internet and help others understand how the system works. We can continue, so we can continue working to serve the global community in the best possible ways. Today, we not only need to ensure that the internet continues to grow safely and in a stable manner, we should also cherish it and ensure that it continues to bring the people in the world together. ICANN is committed to fulfilling, fulfilling its responsibilities to that and will step up when needed. We're also willing to lend our knowledge and technical expertise where and when needed. We're all working together to ensure the internet serves the world in the best possible way. ICANN is determined to continue to deliver on our mission, recognizing that this is a key part of how the global internet functions. So with that, Mandy, back to you. Thank you, Martin. Thank you for that important introduction on ICANN's role and a framing of this discussion on go governance. Uh, now I'd like to give the floor to Jorn Marby, ICANN CEO, to discuss the concept of technical internet governance and ICANN's role within it. Jorn? Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Mandy, and, and thank you, Martin. So I, I hope that this we will have some time for discussion as well uh, after this. Uh, and I'm, I'm really sorry that I'm not meeting all of you in, in Poland, which I was looking forward to. Anyway, I, I'm sure that you all will agree that the internet should be a resource available to everyone. And, and so we can all benefit from it. And, and I hope that you will agree that this is becoming increasingly important that we all work together and building this unique and shaping and building and continue to shape and build this unique resource. I mean, every, every stakeholder, uh, every interested party, whenever they come from government, civil society, business or academia or any other group has a stake, uh, has a responsibility and obligation in its growth and evolution. This is the key to what I think and we think is important, the, the multi-stakeholder model of go governance. 
But, but we therefore need to find new ways of understanding and working together to protect what we all know to be this important resource in a, in a digital age. I mean, historically, technical experts has been tried, and let's be frank, has been tried to simplify explanations of how the internet operates, providing high level models that aim to help non-technical individuals to understand the basics of the internet technologies. However, what we've seen is that this sometimes overly simpl simplistic models may be assumed by non-technical legislators and regulators to be how the internet actually works, which can result in misunderstandings that becomes embedded into laws, regulations, or standards. The effort with what we call the technical internet governance are intended to improve the understanding of the technical underpinnings of the internet among non-technical stakeholders within governments, businesses, civil society, or academia, or anyone else. So um, the intention is to avoid unintended consequences. Th that is why we start to, to distinguish between technical internet governance and internet governance. And I know that some of you will not agree with you, with, well, not because I, of course it's gonna simplify, but the, the internet governance has historically been focused on the question of who has access to internet and, and what they will do with it. What we think when we try to describe technical internet governance is focus on how an internet actually operates, involving more than just the technical comp competence relevant to, the, to ICANN and the DNS ecosystem. The, it's included efforts, but all of those that can affect and, and contribute to making the network more stable, secure, and more resilient, such as internet standard, standards development, organization, network operators, hardware manufacturers, protocol designers, software engineers, and, and the list could just go on. That is our focus today. Where is a juncture where this distinction is going to be more important to ever. It's especially important now when many countries are developing new internet related regulations and legislations that aim to tackle the main internet related issues we face or has they defi this, uh, defined this to face is that cyber security, cyber warfare, cyber uh, espionage, product of personal data, e-commerce, data, locality, internet access, and et cetera, et cetera. When the role of a technical internet governance, ICANN's goal is to clarify positions itself as a technical nonprofit organization that is keen to keep legislators and regulators to understand and therefore to be mindful of the way that internet functions. Some of you may ask why. The straightforward answer is to avoid the development of new legislations, regulations, or policy initiatives that could negatively impact the technical function of the internet. Because these new regulations and or legislations could have a negative impact on the stable global interoperable internet, one component of being the DNS. Well, we are concerned with really three types of dialogues. Discussions taking place in the IGO initiatives, discussions and decisions taking place in the standardization bodies and regulatory in, 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 initiatives uh, at the national or regional government level. Because the, the, the arenas where these discussions are taking place are diverse. ICANN's participation in this conversation has expanded and has to be expanded. A part of why we're having the session is also to be transparent from ICANN, what we do and when we do it. And it's important to note that not all challenges to a stable, secure, resilient internet are related to legislation. Many other threats that we see against the open internet could come from standardization. I mean, case in point, 5G uh, and the new IP are proposed standards that we're carefully monitoring and analyzing for a potential impact on the ability for people to connect to what we today define as the internet. To maintain an interconnected internet, we must therefore talk about the technical implications of policies, especially with the non-technical stakeholders within government, business, and civil society, etc. The introduction of the general, I mean, take GDPR as an example, demonstrated the need to early engage with legislators and regulators to help them to assess the impacts of their initiatives. We will, of course, as a non-political organization, have an opinion about the legislation as itself, the impact of the legislation or the purpose of the uh, legislation. What we want to do is that the legislators should understand the consequences from a technical perspective of the legislations. It is important for all of us to be aware of an evolving landscape of the challenges that may present in order to assess the uh, appropriate approach. New discussions that can affect ICANN and the internet are occurring in new places that addresses new challenges in connecting people to the internet. This creates a potential for new threats to the function of the interoperable internet originating from places we haven't encountered them before. 
For ICANN, that means that we need to broaden our engagement to interact with those that previously had not interacted with us. This in turn helps decision makers of all levels avoid triggering anticipated consequences. Focusing on the concept of technical internet governance encourages us to look at the current state of affairs from a technical perspective of governing the internet. This perspective is an outcome of the increased attention paid by governments to more aspects of the internet due to the ever increasing importance of the internet in society, economically, educationally, and socially, and Zoom related. I mean, for me, I can exist for a very specific purpose. We're here to provide a service to the world. It's to continue to do so. We need to evolve our engagement and address the understanding of technical protocols that are potential challenge to security, stability, and resilience of the internet differently. At the end of the day, our common goal is to ensure that the internet remains singular, unified, and interoperable at the next billion internet users comes online. That's why we're here at the IGF and why we're actively engaged in stakeholders like you through the processes. We need to preserve and support continued innovation of this fantastic thing we call the internet, not the platforms, but the very core that supports the platform's existence. To do this, we are committed to lending our knowledge and technical expertise to legislators where and when needed to ensure policy choices are made with a full understanding of the possible impact they, may, they might have on the internet core infrastructure. The positive thing is not ICANN is not alone in this. Together with our partners in the numbers uh, community, with ISOC, with ITF and other ones, we are part of a very strong ecosystem. With this, we also want to make ICANN's role a little bit clearer, uh, but we will also to help and work together with our partners. We are in this together, all of us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jorn a very helpful overview of technical internet governance. I'd like now to go to Marika Keo, who will update on the activity of the DNS Security Facilitation Initiative Technical Study Group, part of ICANN's work in this area. Marika, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mandy. And uh, good day, everyone. Good morning, good evening, wherever you may be around the globe and uh, following this session. Um, following on what has been said so far on our perspective of technical internet governance and an alignment with the five-year ICANN strategic plan, I, plan, I want to focus on a key initiative that was introduced earlier this year that supports ICANN's position. This is the DNS Security Facilitation Initiative Technical Study Group. This technical study group uh, is a CEO initiated project and it was introduced uh, in May of this year. It is charged with providing recommendations to the ICANN CEO on ways to establish and promote best practices, facilitate communications between ecosystem participants and implement processes to help stakeholders handle threats to the DNS. These recommendations will involve discussion and consultation with relevant stakeholders. Policy related issues are out of scope as this is purely a technical mandate. This technical study group is made up of a number of invited guests that have uh, cross-functional expertise. The expertise is quite varied and it includes handling emergency response coordination DNS uh, security and building out, architecting and operating large scale DNS operations, generic network architecture and design, and also in-depth DNS protocol knowledge. And the group is being supported by members of the ICANN organization. This technical study group will explore areas around what ICANN can and should be doing to increase the level of collaboration and engagement the DNS ecosystem stakeholders to improve the security profile of the DNS. And the group aims to have um, some kind of recommendations by May of 20, uh, 2021, so next year. The technical study group will structure development of its recommendations around five key questions. And these are as follows. What are the mechanisms or functions that are currently available that address DNS security? 
So this relates to what are the best practices and technologies that exist today to help mitigate um, uh, issues around uh, DNS security issues. Can we identify the most critical gaps in the current DNS security landscape? Who is best suited to fill those gaps? Then also another question is what are the risks associated with any of these gaps that may not be well understood? And does the DNS have unique characteristics that attract security problems which other internet services do not have? The goal of this study group is to look at the cross-functional aspects of the DNS and to create the recommendations to the ICANN CEO that will help promote best practices, facilitate communication, and implement processes to help all stakeholders mitigate and or respond to the threats of the DNS ecosystem. Um, I am happy to announce that the technical study group has completed its first very important milestone with the completion of the charter and the project plan. And the completion of this work in a timely matter, especially uh, during the challenges that we are facing for the lack of face-to-face -face meetings um, and the fact that workloads have increased for everybody, um, because this is a purely volunteer effort for all TSG members uh, is really greatly appreciated. I am just incredibly grateful for the productive conversations we've had so far and the promise to more to come. So that's a quick update on, on this technical study group. Thank you very much. Thank you, Merke. Now I'd like to turn to David Conrad who will cover other aspects of the work ICANN does in the realm of technical internet governance and our efforts to foster a trusted, open, secure, single internet David. Yeah, thank you, Mandy. Um, as mentioned, I'm ICANN's uh, Chief Technology Officer. Um, so the technical uh, part of technical internet governance is obviously a uh, particular interest of mine. Um, one area in which technical internet governance comes into play is in new technologies, um, either real or proposed, and how those technologies may impact the internet. Uh, examples would include 5G, new IP, digital object architecture, uh, block lists. Um, there's uh, a, a, a number of technologies that are um, potentially impacting uh, the internet. Um, but looking at those four specifically, um, you know, with 5G, um, one of the areas that we look at is how network slicing uh, can impact the way the internet runs and how it's being used. Um, network slicing can present uh, different internets to, to, depending on uh, what you're paying for. And this can potentially result in ambiguity uh, depending on which segment or which slice of the internet you're actually uh, looking at. Um, does example.com mean the same thing as it would on another slice? In new IP, uh, this is a technology being proposed by uh, uh, Huawei and its uh, affiliate, uh, affiliate um, uh, Futureway. Um, it proposes a new underlying infrastructure uh, for the internet, um, which is defined in a top-down way. Um, this would necessarily create a new internet, uh, one based on new IP addresses as opposed to the existing IP addresses, um, despite the fact that you can use the existing IP addresses within a new IP, it would still uh, require some sort of translational gateway, uh, thereby creating essentially a, a, a new internet. Um, how that internet would interact with the existing internet is an area of concern and uh, interest. Um, with digital op object architecture, also known as DOA, um, it creates a new naming universe as opposed to the new addressing universe you would see in new IP. Um, DOA would have a different administrative structure uh, requiring users to know which naming user naming universe uh, to select and how to select it. Um, blockchains is an interesting technology. It's been explored in uh, many different areas, uh, but its applications in the context of uh, technical internet governance uh, remains a bit unclear. Um, specifically, what problem does blockchain uh, uh, apply to? 
Um, and how does that technology actually solve that problem? Um, all of these technologies have pros and cons. Um, the technical implications of those technologies um, may not be fully understood by folks who are working on developing uh, legislation or regulation. Um, within ICANN, we're not uh, unthinkingly wedded to any particular technology. Um, rather, we believe that a bottom-up multi-stakeholder approach fully informed by objective and unbiased uh, data-driven analyses is more supportive of the innovation and acceptance uh, that we've seen in the internet over the last couple of decades than top-down driven mandates. In terms of these objective unbiased data-driven analyses, um, some examples uh, that I can cite uh, that we uh, are undertaking within the organization, ICANN organization are um, uh, projects uh, such as the DNS abuse activity uh, reporting project, uh, which tracks reports of domain names used in phishing, malware distribution, botnet command and control and spam, uh, and provides that information to the community. Uh, our goal there has been to provide sort of a, a, uh, a consistent reference, a consistent reference of data so that we can see how different policies uh, will impact uh, those four security threats uh, that we see in the internet. We have another project called the Identifier Technologies Health Indicators, uh, ITHI, um, and that in, is collecting data on metrics that can shed light on how the inter identifier systems are evolving um, and whether that evolution is healthy or not. Uh, similar to uh, DNS abuse activity reporting or DAR, um, ITHI's goal is to provide longitudinal data so that we can compare over time how different policies are impacting the way the identifier systems are, are evolving. A uh, more recent project, the uh, Domain Name Security Threat Identification Collection and Reporting Project, um, was triggered by reports of uh, a surge in COVID-related re domain names being registered for malicious purposes. Um, DNS sticker uh, was uh, aimed at collecting reports of those domain names, uh, specifically ones used in phishing and malware distribution, verifying as much as we were able to that those domains were actually malicious. And when we determined that we were uh, based on a relatively high criteria, we notified the sponsoring registrars uh, for those registrars to investigate and take appropriate actions. Um, and finally, one project, not really a project, but a, an engagement uh, approach that we've taken is that at every um, ICANN meeting, um, we have an emerging identifier technology session uh, where we aim to bring in speakers uh, that are expert in new technologies, um, regardless of uh, what they might be, to present uh, those technologies to the ICANN community and take questions uh, during the ICANN meetings. Uh, in that way, we hope to expose the community to these new technologies um, and whether or not those technologies uh, will take off. It's something that um, we within the org, um, within the organization uh, aim uh, to not necessarily have an opinion, but to provide objective data for the community uh, to include within their uh, policy deliberations. So um, within the internet governance world, um, ICANN is uh, a technical organization and our focus on technical internet governance aims to help um, ensure that the internet uh, is as secure, stable and resilient uh, as it can be. Within the organization, um, we offer uh, objective unbiased data to help the community evolve the internet system of identifiers. And we look forward to continuing doing that in the future. And with that, I'll hand it back to Mandy. Thank you, David. I'd now like to open the session up to the question and answer segment of our open forum. Um, and I, we've got folks monitoring the Q&A pod. Uh, and also, we've got some other questions that have come in. And while we're waiting for the queue to set up, um, can I just ask, uh, 
Joran or uh, Martin, would you like to expand on how ICANN will contribute its technical expertise to the global internet policy development? Is that only going to be within the context of technical internet governance? Or uh, will it also be in other aspects of the internet governance ecosystem? Yeah. Well, basically what's important for us to do our work is that uh, our work is well understood. And whereas our mission is focused on the domain name system on, on the unique identifier system, uh, measures that are taken by others uh, will uh, make a difference on how we can do our work. And this is why uh, this focus uh, is so important. But Joron can tell much better than I do what we do about it, Joron. Uh, one of the interesting aspects with, with, I think I can, and the whole ecosystem is that the world is evolving. Uh, the, 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 the COVID situation has put a, a, a special, a special uh, attention to the internet as, as a functioning uh, sets of technologies that works together. And, and in many of the conversations we have um, outside the ecosystem, we often tend to sort of stand there with a white wall and actually explain how it works. And, and this is this is the notion that I think that we we need to we need to be better at from the whole ecosystem. It's not only I can to really speak to the people who are making decisions in standard decision forums, political forums, um, in in the UN system or local government, and, and really explain that we we don't take a position about the policies itself, but we really want you to understand that if you make a policy like this, it might actually have effect on your ability to connect to the internet itself. And we've seen proposals like that. I mean, we have directly engaged. And we do that transparency. We always talk about it with our community about what we do. But we've seen proposals that actually could disconnect people from the internet. And when we tell that to legislators, that that's not our intention. And we, we understand that. Many of the proposals we see is about the are, are, are done for, for good intention. The, and so we, we don't think this is a hostile world in that sense. But there are, I mean, and, and then of course, the internet creates many new business models and, and has been disruptive to many business models, um, which often has been to the benefit of the consumers. And, and of course, we see that at, attempts uh, to, to change those business models uh, to, to, to certain technologies. And I'm not talking about the platforms or you know, what happens on top of the internet. Uh, I'm actually talking about the technology itself. And, and David mentioned uh, about network slicing in 5G, for instance, and which is one of those things that we follow carefully because it can actually change the underlying principle of how internet actually works by, by sort of traffic into a mobile cloud which is probably good for some things. On the other hand, can take away the ability for people outside the mobile cloud to connect to people um, on a fixed network, even from a technical perspective. So there, there are different, different forums that we're now engaging in. And, and, and I think that it's important for our community and, and all other communities just that we are transparent about what we do and therefore we have this conversation. I hope that, and, and, and another point is that as, as David again mentioned, uh, I'm quoting my David today, um, we are also trying to more and more create tools and processes uh, for things so we can be more transparent and less ad hoc. Um, I mean, the tools, the DAR and the sticker and the other and the health indicators are a system that is open and publicly available for everybody so they can actually have a, uh, have a look on, on, on what we do and how we do it and can contribute to it. Marek is uh, the TSG, the technical study group that we're doing, also shows the uniqueness of this ecosystem because we, we, we define a problem that increased um, in, increased threats to the DNS systems around the world from a technical perspective. ICANN is not the controller of those DNS systems. We are peers. We're working together with all the top level domain operators because when we delegated, it's, it's the top level domain operators who are responsible. And what we're trying to form together with them as peers as colleagues is a better information system. So if someone is a DNS system in one part of the world gets attacked, we can use that knowledge to prevent other attacks. So it's really about building something that we collegially shaping things together. And that is really the way we believe in the internet. It shouldn't be a centralized system. It shouldn't be something that someone takes control of. That's the multi-stakeholder model, but also technology wise, making sure that the ones who are independent from each other, which has been worked so well, actually make sure that we can take on, on, on knowledge we have about threats to the DNS as well. So 
it's a it, it's like a Swedish smorgasbord with a lot of different things. The important things is actually to working together. Thank you, Yarn. And I see we have a number of uh, questions now in the Q and A pod. I'm going to turn to my colleague Luna to read them out, and we'll get answers for you. Thank you, Mandy. Um, the first question is from Mark Datasgeld. As ICANN reaffirms its position as technical and data-driven, will it close in on contracted parties known to be bad actors for many security-related studies and hold them accountable for their actions? I, I can answer that. So one of the uniqueness of the system and one of the reasons I, I, I believe in what I do is because that is a very good questions. And I hope that you can engage in the ICANN community to answer that question. The, the format of how I can works, which is, which is really, really uh, important to me, is that I don't set policies. The ICANN board doesn't set policies. It's come through a multi-stakeholder model, which I, I actually say has been extremely effective, uh, shaping the internet users around the world uh, for, for many uses in a very short period of time. From the outside, sometimes it might look devious and a lot of conversations, but it's really something, you know, it's, it's really, I think it's working well. So the way we want to manage those things is really comes out of policies from the uh, from set from the multi-stakeholder model, and that's where it should belong. Uh, what we're talking about here is the and being transparent is the work that I can is doing when it comes to doing what we believe in when it comes to protecting the ability for people to connect to the internet. So thank you very much for a good question, and I recommend you please participate in the ICANN community, and we can help you if you need to get contacts into there. Thank you. We have another question from Laurie Shulman. It is encouraging to see ICANN engaging more broadly in public policy discussions, filling comments and educating legislators as to the function of the DNS is critical to the development of sensible rules and regulations. Assuming that implementation of GDPR is positioned at number one, what do you envision as the second biggest challenge to ICANN from a legislative perspective? Who would like to answer this? I guess it's me again. So I don't want to post the privacy regulations around the world as a problem for ICAP, because that would be, first of all, that would be wrong. Uh, and the other thing is that, you know, there would, you know, ICANN shouldn't take a position if the privacy legislation um, is, is right or wrong. The, the, the reason I'm, I'm talking about GDPR is because it has an effect on our operations. It has, it's probably the first legislation that has a direct effect on our, the ICANN community's ability to make policies. It sort of puts the policy into the box. Um, we can only do certain policies because we have a legislation. And we often talk about it as the European GDPR, but um, th there are uh, different versions of privacy legislations, not only in, in from Europe, there are, you know, we have them in California, we'd have them in other places, and we see more and more of them because there is a there's a bigger interest in in in, in um, there is a bigger interest in in, in privacy related matters on the internet now than ever before, I think. Um, it's just that GDPR is also one of the strongest regimes of this one, which means that if we get to understand how that works, um, we 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 you know we, we are a we have uh, contracting parties, we have domain uh, name owners all over the world. We, un if we get that right, it's probably high probability we get it right in other places. But, but the point is here that, so I just wanna put that into, so we don't problematize something the, the, that, that we shouldn't problematize. So our problem with this is that it's a new law. There's a lot of uncertainty in the law, how to interpret the law. And I think community has done a fantastic job, I think, when it comes to our policy work. It's actually quite amazing. Uh, now to get the final answers about GDPR, it's in the hands of the legislators, the European Union, uh, and especially the European Commission to take the next steps. ICANN has reached its point where we can do stuff, but we all agree, we all agree on that. So I, I mean, it's, so what are the next big challenges? I mean, we have seen different parts, we have, you know, we, we, we are engaged with our own community and governments around the world to so better to understand the technical impact of the legislation. So we've seen, we have interacted uh, with some governments around the world about legislative proposals, always transparent and always open. But I actually think that the, the other avenue now is in what I call standardizations. Um, and some of the things that David talked about, it's actually doesn't come out of legislations. It comes out of, of proposals for standardizations. I'm, 
it might not come as a surprise to anyone that I believe it's really important that the standardization for internet stays within the multi-stakeholder model, stays within the ecosystem, and stays within the ITF. We have seen attempts to move that out of this setting, uh, move it into other venues, which I don't think is a good thing. I, new IP, uh, things in, in 5G are examples of that. I think that is one of the challenges for us uh, to make sure that we can, when people, regardless of the infrastructure, regardless of mobile, Wi-Fi, fixed, whatever you call it, they all go to one interoperable internet. And that's why one of the reasons why we're having this setting today. Thank you. We have uh, anyone else from the panelists would like to input? No. We have another question from Peter Gruter. Is the influence of the GAC on ICANN changing? And if yes, how? Well, Peter, thanks for the question. Uh, for those who are less familiar with uh, ICANN, the GAC stands for the Government Advisory Committee and more than 170 governments around the world signed up to contribute to our processes via this advisory committee. Its role and its uh, change is, is, is not changing, uh, yet it's for us a very important body and we take the advice very seriously uh, and it's very appreciated. So I've, I, I do think that over time you see that the GEC has truly contributed to our understanding of what the public interest is from a government's perspective. And that's relevant for us. So we're extremely grateful. Yes, but no, the role isn't changing as it is. Hope this helps. These are the questions in the Q&A pod so far. Mandy. Hey. Thank you, Luna. And uh, I'd like to go back to our panelists at this point. Um, America, may, may I make, could I make, because I forgot to mention one small thing. One of the reasons why we are also engaging this is the worst case, because it's easy to, to sometimes think that sometimes looks good. I mean, it's some, it feels good, but it actually could be not good. I mean, one example is that we've seen a proposal over the last couple of months that, that the UN system should, uh, should, um, uh, should name the DNS as a critical infrastructure, which on the surface looks like, what a great idea. What, you know, that you know, all governments around the world stands up and say the DNS is, is very important. First of all, they already have done that because in the GAC, uh, they all came together about the transition. So the governments around the world has actually already recognized the importance of the DNS, but they also recognized ICANN's role in that and the ICANN multi-stakeholder model into it. So what sometimes seems as a, you know, on a, as a good suggestion, sometimes has some drawbacks because we believe that the DNS belongs in the ecosystem where we belong. We don't think that the UN, and we have we have very good relationship with the UN. We are we have good relationship with, with with the different parts of the UN system. So it's not about the UN itself. We just don't believe that it should be part of their official competence, because if it becomes a part of the UN competence, that could have other ramifications for where where they have member states who might be not so positive of the multi-stakeholder model. So just to give you that, it's it's sometimes what on the surface looks very interesting and good. If you actually open the hood, you will see it's much more problematic. Sorry. Thank you, Jorn. Yeah. Um, I do have a question uh, that I'd like to put to uh, Marike. Can you tell us a little bit more about the Domain Security Facilitation Initiative? Uh, who are the members of the technical study group and how is this going to feed into ICANN's role within technical internet governance? Absolutely. Thank you for the question, Mandy. Yeah, it has become very clear um, to ICANN and I think a lot of other stakeholders that um, DNS uh, stability and security involves a collaboration amongst a lot of different players. So for example, um, there might be uh, routing hijacks that are instantiated because they really, the net goal is to impact uh, DNS, uh, DNS stability and trustworthiness. And so as this uh, technical study group was instantiated, 
uh, it was very clear that we needed uh, very much uh, multi, uh, a cross-functional, uh, multi-community participation. And therefore the uh, participation absolutely needed to include uh, members that have routing expertise, members that have had uh, expertise for well over a decade in handling various types of network related uh, incidents, be it routing related, DNS related, um, or anything else, because usually there's a lot of uh, interplay between all of these issues. And so the main task and focus is to take a look at what are the campaigns that have been instantiated in the last decade? You know, how are they growing? Um, what are the, 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 I call them root causes, but that's not really accurate because that just assigns blame to someone or some entity, but really looking at what are the factors that contribute to um, having these attacks be successful. And then looking at what kind of collaboration can I can facilitate amongst various different entities that it is already collaborating with to really um, uh, make sure that there is a much more coordinated way to tackle um, uh, and make the DNS and um, the overall network infrastructure much more resilient globally. So I hope that answers the question. Thank you, Mary Kay. Luna, I see we have some other questions. Yes. In the pod. Um, we have from Henriette Esther Hewson. What role do you see for technical internet governance in the UNSG's digital corporation roadmap? Or to put it differently, how active should technical governance processes and institutions in this new digital co cooperation pro process? Who would Mandy, like who, do you want, who would you like to answer that one? Oh, Yarn, would you like to take this on or Martin? Do any, 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 we, first of all, we welcome all the cooperation we have uh, with, the, with the UN system. And, and we will submit when there are proposals, like the proposal right now, that the, the UN system should uh, have a competence about over the DNS. We will tell what we think about that and explain that and reach out to different stakeholders and, and other ones in the world. But it, it's important that we don't buy, because sometimes the, it's a very good example of, of, of how this works is that we believe that some of those conversations will be, it should belong to the multi-stakeholder model in the different parts where we where we from, together with the ITF, together with ISOC, together with the RERs, uh, we, and, and other ones in this ecosystem. That's where I, we believe that that conversation should be happening. So we will always be there to defend that, but we will not, oh, we, it's not like we always participate in discussion because we also then we give credibility to a discussion. And sometimes they even say that we, ICANN was in the room and therefore they agree. So we have a balance in making sure that we, we decide, we, 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 we actually do believe we have to defend the multi-stakeholder model. We, I mean, no, that's not something we, and there's a lot, I mean, most governments around the world believes in the multi-stakeholder model as well. So we actually ending up doing, which together with our parties, is actually telling them, yeah, Please move the discussion to the GAC. Please move the discussion into ICANN uh, and let us engage in it. Because even if it sounds on surface very good to have governments, giving governments a sort of general uh, competence over this would be, we don't believe that's beneficial uh, for the internet itself. That's our belief. So we will engage on particular proposals that come up but not engaging in, 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 in that cooperation as total because we think that that discussion belongs in the multi-stakeholder model. Especially with, you know, some, if that doesn't belong to ICANN, it should belong. And, and the other one, like I want to, you know, the, 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 the country code operators uh, who has their own policy making process, individual policy making, um, they are often involved in this because many of the proposals might affect that. And there we are just there to help and support if they want. 
Thank you, Orin. We have another question from Olivier Crepon Leblanc. If new IP in whatever form it takes was to involve a new addressing and naming system and or hierarchy, do you think that ICANN could be the location where policy for the addressing system is created? Or should ICANN stick to its current responsibilities and solely its current, sorry, its current responsibilities? Should ICANN's mission evolve as the internet evolves? I'll, uh, I'll take this one. Um, so uh, as I mentioned in my uh, remarks, um, we're not um, unthinkingly wedded to any particular technology. Um, the internet uh, system of identifiers has evolved over time and will continue to evolve. However, as uh, I'm sure you're aware, ICANN's mission is uh, extremely restrictive and what it is that we are uh, within org able to work on, look at, uh, develop um, is tightly constrained. If the community decides uh, that um, the naming, addressing, identifier hierarchies associated with new IP were something that ICANN should uh, engage in, um, then you know, we would look at doing that. Uh, at this point, our role with regards to new IP is just trying to provide information to the community uh, so that they actually understand the implications of uh, the, the technology as proposed, uh, what those proposals actually are, um, and how things might actually evolve in the future. Yeah, if, if there's anything I would add to that is uh, please look at the strategic plan that we very clearly explain that we recognize that uh, the addressing system will evolve over time. And we follow that not to protect all technology, but to see what serves the public interest best. So uh, fully agree with uh, David here. May I also add on the specific point about new IP that it's if the, we, uh, the David's team has written a, an excellent paper about new IP, by the way. And, and one of the things that we find there is that it seems like it's sort of built uh, into the, the, the management of the protocol to be very closely related to governments. Um, so it might be, you know, even if we were, I can community in the ecosystem decide it was interesting for us, um, it seems to be uh, that's not the intention of the protocol. But with that said, it's a lot of questions about the proposal, as you can see, but it's a really good document and just marketing it, it's for free. You can download it from our website. Thank you, no more questions in the pod at this point. All right. Do, uh, Luna, I know there just was got a- another question. Sorry. Yep. So yes, we did. So this question is from Siva Subramanian Muthasami. Does this new IP and naming system take into account development of related technologies such as location identifiers and blockchain addresses, micro addresses? David. Um, so one of the, the uh, challenges that we've had uh, in the developing uh, the paper on new IP that uh, Yaron referenced um, was to uh, try to figure out exactly what new IP was, what it, what the technology implied. Um, uh, the, it's not um, standardized in a, uh, a typical way. There aren't RFCs associated with new IP. Um, as far as we were able to tell, um, the new IP addressing structure uh, was uh, intended to be very general um, and allow for um, different types of addresses. I don't recall there being any specific uh, definition of you know, micro addresses or the use of blockchain addresses of uh, uh, any nature. And it doesn't really get into uh, the naming system. I think there's sort of an Implicit assumption that you know some form of DNS would continue to be used to translate uh, new IP uh, or names into new IP addresses, but all of that was is sort of supposition. Uh, again, uh, new IP seems to be more of a a, a list of 
um, issues that people have identified within existing IP technologies and some ideas on how potentially to address those, uh, those issues as opposed to a, uh, a fully thought out and implementable uh, technology, uh, at least uh, from my perspective. Thank you, David. Uh, we don't have any other open questions in the pod, and I am mindful we have five minutes left. However, we did get a request from a participant if some of the written questions and answers, because there have been uh, several that we handled through typing, whether any of those could be read out. Um, I'm a little concerned that we're running out of time, and so we'll look for a way to uh, post that information, but uh, I'd like to turn back to uh, our panelists to see if there are any um, final comments. Martin? Thanks, Mandy, and thanks all for being with us in this session. Uh, for ICANN, it's very important also to be exposed to those outside of ICANN, uh, because we may well touch upon your world of uh, the internet, and we're relevant, and uh, your opinion is relevant to us, so participation is key. And uh, we continue to reach out and see how we can work with others to make all this happen together. The internet has shown to be a very important means in our world to keep on going, to be able to continue to communicate. And the addressing system is, is key in that as well. So we're committed and thanks for being there with us. And thanks all for your contributions here on the panel as well. Thank you. Um, thank you, Martin. Uh, we've got one last question. Janis Karklin is asking about the ICANN office in Geneva. Um, uh, all of our offices are currently closed during uh, due to COVID-19. That doesn't mean that our engagement and presence has changed in any way. Just like the rest of the world, that uh, engagement is taking place online. And so we have to go through an internal process in determining when it is uh, safe and appropriate based on local um, conditions. And, and uh, in fact, the advice coming from those governments about when certain kinds of meetings will uh, be possible again. And we also have our own internal process for determining when it is appropriate for uh, staff to be physically attending uh, meetings. But that is what we're doing right now. We, we are still actively engaged in, in Geneva and IGO processes. Well, I'd like to thank our panelists and I'd like to thank all of our uh, attendees. Uh, this has been a very interesting and useful session. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much.